Good morning, everybody. How is everyone this morning? Good to hear. Do you guys have good discussions about your favorite holiday places? Anyone have any good ones? Yes? New York. Well, that's, that's pretty up there, I'd say. That's pretty good. Anyone have any other ones? Yes? Bundaberg. Bundaberg. New York, Bundaberg, you know, similar vibes, yeah? Surfing down the dunes. Oh, that sounds really fun. Oh, awesome. That is amazing. Loving all your holiday ideas. My absolute favorite place to go on holidays is without a doubt the trip that my family uh, makes to Cotton Tree on the Sunshine Coast every year. We go every September school holidays. We pack up our, our house and into a little caravan and we all scoot up the motorway um, and we set up this spot, wonderful spot right on the water. It's literally five steps and you're like on the beach, which is incredible. It's my dream location. You can see the water um, from the windows of the caravan. It's so lovely. Um, we commit to relaxing by the beach for two whole weeks. No work, just reading, playing games on the sand, lying there, literally nothing to do. It is so beautiful. And I remember being there the first year and experiencing all of the things that I love most about going to Cotton Tree. How close we were to the beach, doing all the kayaking and the adventures that we do, seeing all the sunsets. And if you know me, I'm a mad sunset lover. Um, all these wonderful things. And each year, it's these experiences that create a desire in me and a longing to go back and experience it all again. But all of us also experience desires in our everyday lives. We long to be somewhere, we long to do something, or to be with certain people as well. And this might change depending on whether you're an introvert or you're an extrovert. Shout out to all the introverts that love their introvert moments. It could be wherever your friends and family are. It can change depending on whether you're a sport guru, like you definitely see Millie Valentine at a Big Bash cricket game. Or if you're a creative at heart and all you want to do is paint or dance or sing. Maybe you're just super excited about the travel bubble opening up and us being able to go international and you're negotiating with your family where the first trip is, like back to New York or something like that. But it's the same with our relationships as well. There might be somebody you're just a little bit interested in and you know you'll do anything to be with them and do whatever they want to do whether that's with a special friend or it's Maddie Lucas going to a Harry Styles concert. Wherever you like going the most and whatever you like to do the most, I believe these preferences are shaped by what and who we're passionate about. These desires are shaped by what we love the most and what draws us in and the positive experiences that we've had with them in the past. And this is the same in our relationship with God. This whole idea of desire and longing got me thinking to myself, do I get excited to be with God? Am I reading my Bible just to feel accomplished when I get a tick and a, you've completed another day of your Bible plan notification? Or am I reading it because I really want to hear and read the words of God and to be with Him? Do I come to church to worship with my family and to engage and reflect on what the preacher's saying? Or is it just because I get to see my friends and it's a cool place to hang out? Do I really get excited to spend time with God? Do I long to spend time with Him? Often, the answer is no. But sometimes this has really inspired me in my relationship with God is the book of Psalms. And this idea of longing and desiring is something that's really clearly demonstrated in the Psalm we're looking at today, and that's Psalm 84, which is why the title of my message is The Desire to Dwell. So Psalm 84 is written by the sons of Korah, who were appointed musicians that served in the temple of worship. It describes the author's intense desire to be in God's temple and to be in the presence of God. It's just a beautiful psalm, definitely one of my favorite ones. So I'm going to read through the whole psalm and then we'll pick out a few verses to do with the desire to dwell. So if you have your phones, if you have your Bibles, would you grab that out with me? We're going to turn to Psalm 84. All right. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. 
Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Bacar, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. So for me, the first few verses of this psalm just show how earnestly the writer is longing to dwell with and have a home with God. It's not just a, yeah, this is cool, or or everyone else looks like they're doing it, so I guess this is something I should do. The author genuinely and authentically longs. They even say their soul yearns and faints. Their heart and flesh cry out for the living God. But when I read this, I feel like this isn't really my experience or my desire at all. It's so easy to lose that desire and meaning in our relationship with God. It's easy to get caught in a routine of school during the week, sandwiched by YC on a Sunday and then youth on a Friday night, which is a place to see your friends and hang out with leaders and get involved in some fun games. And this is all good things. We long for community and community is an important part of being a human. So there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But the kind of longing and desire this psalmist encompasses isn't just about the place and the building and everything that's happening around it. It's about longing for God. Verse 2 says, My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. This person has had an experience of God and they're longing for more. So how do we start to long for someone? It doesn't always just happen. It begins when we notice something like how someone flicks their hair or when someone takes their mask off and we see their smile and you realize how beautiful they are. Or you notice someone has a way of encouraging and uplifting other people around them. Or in any conversation a certain person is a part of, there's never a shortage of joy and laughter in life because of what they bring. In all of these things, you catch a glimpse of someone's character and this experience is what draws you in. This experience shapes our desire to be with someone. You want to spend more time with them. You want to talk to them, hear more about them, see them more. And the desire to be with them and near them just continues to grow. And this is the same with God. The psalmist has seen the goodness of God. He's had an experience of God, a revelation of him and his character. And because of this revelation, he says in verse 10, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. There's a song playing in your head, me too. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. But the crazy thing is, the doorkeeper was at the outermost part of the temple. They were the furthest from the action, the worship, the furthest from where God's presence resided. It was like God's presence was super tangible at the center of the temple and then kind of got less and less so the further away you were. So being a doorkeeper meant that they were only getting a glimpse of God, the smallest sense of his presence. And even still, the psalmist would rather this experience than be right in the middle of the action in the tents of the wicked or anywhere else. Because he knows that even God just brushing past him is a better experience than anything else. And that's why this psalmist so desired to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord, then be with the wicked. They longed to be in God's presence always. The desire and love for God meant that they always wanted to be around him and they wanted to be shaped by him. And I just feel like I should say, for those here who are thinking, but I try really hard, I want to know God more, I want to have more of a desire to be with him, but sometimes I just don't. I first want to say, you're definitely not alone. I totally understand that feeling. You are not a failure, you're not worth any less, and God does not love you any less. The psalmist's heart to be with God is inspiring. We should find it inspiring. But it's so important to know that this heart does not come from any efforts, any striving, any serving, or anything that they do to put themselves in that spot. It starts first with God. I think this is articulated well in Psalm 46, verse 10. Popular verse says, Be still and know that I am God. The invitation of this verse is just to be still, to know. 
to dwell in God's presence and to experience his goodness. Not to always do and to always work important things, but to remember, to rest, to be in awe of God, to know his presence. He will come and meet you when you rest in him. There's a quote from Friedricha Matthews Green um, for people who hunger for God's presence, but don't, they don't think they feel it or they don't feel it in big dramatic ways. She says, my hunch is that you're already sensing something of God's presence or you wouldn't care. Picture yourself walking around a shopping mall, looking at people in the window displays, if you can picture it in your head. Suddenly, you get a whiff of cinnamon. You weren't even hungry, but now you really crave a cinnamon roll. This craving isn't something you made up. There you were, minding your own business, when some drifting molecules of sugar, butter, and spice collided with a susceptible patch inside your nose. You had a real encounter with cinnamon, not a mental delusion, not an emotional projection, but the real thing. And what was the effect? You want more, now. And if you hunger to know the presence of God, it's because you've already begun to scent God's compelling delight. It's in these little moments that God gives us experiences of him and his character, which create a desire to know him more. What an encouragement that he would be so kind to help us create a desire in us to be near him. We can ask him to help us to love, to love him more. And it's this longing that shapes our actions, our plans, where we go and what we do. This desire was so strong that back when the psalm was written, the Israelites would journey from all over to visit the temple of the Lord, Israel's holy place. Most likely, it was written um, for around the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, and people would set out on a journey, or what's called a pilgrimage, from every part of the country, or even from other countries, because they desired to be part of this festival. They longed to be in God's sanctuary, and they wanted to experience even a glimpse of God's goodness. The author of Psalm 84 describes this journey in verses 5 to 7. He says, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Bacar, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. While this describes the physical journey of the Israelites to God's temple, it can also describe the posture of our hearts daily. The Valley of Bacar is translated as the Valley of Weeping, which doesn't sound like a place you really want to be, but it's used in Psalm 84 to suggest a really sad or a painful part, a point in a journey, a dark season in your life. But the hope we find in this is what comes before and after it. Because the psalmist on his journey finds his strength in God, and his heart is so set on seeing him and being at his temple and being a part of this festival, this valley of weeping becomes a place of springs, a place of life and hope and joy because they find their strength in God and they long to see him. Which doesn't mean that they won't go through the valley of weeping and all of us will have moments where we're facing really difficult circumstances in our lives. But when we find our strength in God, when we hope in him and in his goodness and his grace for our lives, when we choose to rest with him and let our longing to be with him grow, we find that we never, ever face tough situations alone. God is always with us. He's always for us. And the good news is we don't need to take part in a really long trek or journey over mountains and through valleys to reach God's temple. Because we live on the other side of the cross and Jesus sacrificed for us, we don't need to visit the temple like the psalmist did to experience God's goodness. We are the temples of the living God. God's presence is already with us. It's already in us. And we just have to be open to receive it and to press into him. And as we do that, we continue to desire him more and more. And as God begins to reveal himself to you, continue to seek him and to allow your desire to know him grow. When we spend time in worship, when we read our word, when we pray, when we have a walk through nature, when we just abide with him, removing all distractions, that's when we start to long more and more for him and we enter into friendship with him, lifelong friendship. Now, this looks different for everyone, 
And my encouragement for you is not to be discouraged when you feel like it's not working for you or you feel like you're wasting time. I don't even believe that there's such a thing. Wasting time with God is never, ever wasted time. Keep letting yourself be drawn back into His love. Write down and remind yourself of your experiences with Him. These are some of the most encouraging times that you can look back on when you are feeling discouraged. And as the psalmist points out in the last verse of Psalm 84, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Trust God. First and foremost, trust in God. For the psalmist, this desire and longing started with an experience, a moment in which God revealed himself more fully. And in experiencing more of God, it created a desire and a longing to be in his presence and dwell in his house. I love this passage in Ephesians, in the message version in particular. Paul's praying for Ephesus, but I think it's also a prayer that we can pray today. And I'd love to pray over you in a moment. uh, Paul prays for Jesus to dwell in our hearts, for us to be strengthened as we walk with him, and for us to know and experience just how incredible his love for us is, so that we're left with a desire to know him more and more. And I'd love to read this prayer over you all this morning. So if you can stand to your feet. And if you feel comfortable, just open up your hands in front of you to receive. Not as any special thing, but just in a posture of receiving from the Lord, being ready. Just your heart being ready and open. Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. My response is to get down on my knees before the Father, this magnificent Father who parcels out all heaven and earth. I ask Him to strengthen you by His Spirit, not a brute strength, but a glorious inner strength, that Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite Him in, as you invite Him to dwell with you. And I ask Him that with both feet planted firmly on love, you'll be able to take in with all followers of Jesus the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. Reach out and experience the breadth, test its length, plumb the depths, rise to the heights, live full lives, full in the fullness of God. And I believe this morning that God's wanting to have that experience with some people here. He's wanting to show you the extravagant dimensions of His love for you. He's wanting to show you how good He is, how faithful He is, how kind. He's wanting to show you that He's the God of peace. He's the God of joy, the God of hope. And He's a generous God. He doesn't withhold good things from His children. The beautiful thing is, all we have to do is be ready. You don't have to prove yourself, pretend to be somebody else, or have your life in order to have an experience with God. He already knows you fully, and He wants to be with you no matter what. So I want to create an opportunity for you to respond this morning. If you want to have more of this desire to dwell, if you want to have a fresh revelation and experience of God this morning, I just want to invite you to come down to the front in a moment. There's nothing special about this front area here. It's not a Holy Spirit hotspot or anything, but it's a representation of stepping out in faith, having your own pilgrim's journey to the front where we as leaders and as your friends as well can have the opportunity to support you to stand with you and to pray for you. So I encourage you to be open to receive Jesus this morning. If that's you, would you make your way to the front? God is here and He wants to, he wants to meet you where you are. There is no shame. He is here. He wants to know you more. That's okay. Whether you feel like you just need to put your arms in front of you, I just want to encourage you here as the band plays over you just to sit and just to talk to God, just to ask Him to speak to you, ask Him to reveal Himself to you, to show more of His character, more of His love for you. So whether that's putting your arms in front of you, whether that's kneeling like Paul did to pray, just as a practical way of demonstrating the posture of our hearts. Let me pray first. Lord, I thank you that you are so good. 
you're so wonderful. And Lord, that we can come before you and we can ask you to help us to love you more. In this crazy conundrum, Lord, and you, and you do, you reveal more of yourself to us, Lord. You have experiences with us, my God, and it's these things that help us to have more of a desire for you, Lord. And so I ask for your, your presence to come here, my God, that we would know you more. Reveal yourself to us more, my God. In Jesus' name.